Um, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to try to get started. We, uh, we kind of have a two-part program here. Thanks to everybody uh, for attending, and thank for those of you who are on Zoom. It's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy here. But um, anyway, my name is uh, Ron Weisberger. I'm the director of the Holocaust and Genocide Center here at Bristol Community College. Um, we are, as you know, we're going to have a um, program on a wonderful collection. But to, right now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this afternoon's guest speaker. Mark Ludwig is executive director of, and founder of the Theresen Music Foundation, which and is retired from the Boston Symphony Orchestra. You've heard about that orchestra, I think. Yeah. yeah. Where he was t a tenured violist. He, he has performed amazing, with such notable artists as Andre Previn, Joshua Bell, and Leonard Bernstein, one of my favorites. He blends his musical career with social causes, promoting tolerance. He has performed on new, numerous CDs and in concerts to benefit causes in the United States, Bosnia, Darfur, Tibet, and Europe. In 2009, he performed for the Dalai Lama at the United States Capitol in a ceremony awarding His Holiness the Tom Lantos Human Rights Prize. For his global outreach efforts, Mr. Ludwig was nominated to be a UNESCO Artist for Peace and Goodwill Ambassador. Amazing. Mr. Ludwig founded the Turetan Music Foundation in 1991. A Fulbright scholar of the Theresean composers, he has authored essays, programs, and notes in a Holocaust curriculum for schools. He also has two children on top of that, all that. Since 2001, he has been adjunct professor at Boston College, teaching the course of art and music during the Holocaust in Third Reich. We're very pleased to have Mr. Ludwig here to speak about his new book, an amazing book, our Will to Live, the Theresean Music Critiques of Victor Ullman. In this book, he explores concert reviews, posters, and ephemera from the Theresean concentration camp, which is uh, an amazing story in and of itself. However, as Elisa Birdside recently wrote in the Boston Music Intelligencer, this book, quote, is so much more. It's a history lesson, a warning, a reminder, a work of scholarship, a work of love, with a war raging in Europe at this very moment that is eerily reminiscent of horrors that started World War II, this book could not be more important as a beacon to remind us what brutality can be committed by one regime against another group of human beings. So this book is not only important in of itself, it's important for what it tells us about today. So with all that, we welcome Mark Lewis. Thank you, Ron. Um, thank you for having me here. It's good to be back. Um, this place is very special to me because I think of what Ron has built up in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department here. Um, and it's, it's ever expanding. And what you're about to celebrate after this talk, I think that speaks volumes about this community and about his dedication. So he's to be applauded for his work. <laughs> So I want to take you back to the late 1980s, and that's really the origins of this book. And it's kind of great that I have the backdrop of this Holocaust Studies Library, because it, I'm taking you back to an afternoon where I was in the Strand Bookstore. And what I would do, I had a habit in New York before playing a concert in Carnegie Hall. It was like a way to relax. And in one of those visits, I came across the biography of Rabbi Leo Beck, and I was surprised to find that he was in prison in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. But what really grabbed my attention were two lines in the chapter titled Theresienstadt. The first one, quote, poets and musicians tried to capture the hunger, cold, and sadness in words and music. And then this was later followed by The composer, Victor Ullmann, was noted for writing an opera in the camp. So probably like many of you, you know, I had these questions of like, who is this Victor Ullmann? Who are these poets, these musicians? And did any of their works survive? 
So a few months later, I'm driven by these questions and I find myself in Prague walking down Parzyska Boulevard. And Parzyska, if you've been there, it's, it's this, these beautiful Art Nouveau buildings in the fabled Jewish quarter of Prague. So it's steeped in history. And I walk into what was called the Chesky Hudebny Fund, the Czech Music Fund, which was the great repository of all music written by Czech composers. And the director hands me a stack of music. Um, I look at music that, well, looked very much like this. In fact, this was one of the parts, right? Now, this is not the manuscript, but the reason why I want you to... Just, just let me see if I can get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> well, at least she's not in the bathroom. <laughs> <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, can you imagine, I, I see a part and I'm looking and I'm hearing music that, this is new to me and it's by yet another com new composer, Gideon Klein, and then I go through another piece and another piece and there are other composers who are all new to me. And, and this is rather unusual for the following in my background. I had already been a member of the Boston Symphony for six years. I came from a very distinguished classical music family, and people in my network did not know of, of these composers, let alone the music. And so I, here I'm looking at this music, and I asked them, I said, could you Xerox this? And they looked at me like I came from another planet, all right, because you have to remember, this was Prague, which had just endured not only occupation of the Nazis, but the, Nazi, the Soviet occupation and they were months away from the Velvet Revolution. All right? So this was a place that was in some ways stuck in time. All right? So they said, well, we'll get the music to you, and a month later, I have all hand-copied parts. Not Xerox, hand-copied, all right? Because, and the reason why I really tell you about this is that not only to, to date myself, but the other thing is that um, this was music that was yet to be published. And I want to share uh, an excerpt from my book where I write about the scores and the new names that I'm encountering. And I write, I work my way through them, hearing the interplay of voices in my mind's ear. I was thunderstruck by the beauty, sophistication, and power of these works created by people who daily face suffering and mortality. This was music beyond my expectations. I couldn't wait to play it. So I have to tell you now, over 30 years later, I am still astonished at the beauty and the power of this music and its history. And what I'd like to do is share from you just a little sampling, a teaser, if you will, from the book, some of the critiques, some history, a little few musical excerpts, and some stunning artwork. Um, and to begin with, I think we should delve right in to Terezin. Let's see if we can go to that. Uh, let's see, we got it. Oh, we're locked. Hmm. There we go. So Terezin, it's located 60 kilometers northwest of Prague. And on October 10th, 1780, Emperor Franz Joseph II laid the cornerstone of what would be two fortresses, a large and a small, to protect the Austro-Hungarian Empire from Prussian armies. With its diminishing military role, the large fortress became a quaint garrison town, as you can see in the scenes in this charming turn-of-the-century postcard. While the small fortress served a much darker purpose, holding political and military prisoners like Soviet POWs in World War I, and most notably, Gavril Princip, the assassin of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In late fall of 1941, the Nazis selected the large fortress as a quote-unquote ghetto settlement for Czech Jews, as exemplified by this work of art rendered by a prisoner. And like the postcard you just saw, he includes the same landmarks, the church steeple and the barracks, but he places them within the camp walls in the shape of a Jewish star. When the first transport of 342 Jewish men arrived to convert a garrison town of about 7,500 people, what would become a concentration camp 
that at one point would have over 63,000 people. So Terezin's purpose was expanded in scope and scale. Jews within the German Reich and occupied territories were sent to Terezin and ultimately to the east for extermination. 90,000 of the 141,000 Terezin prisoners were sent to the east. In addition to serving as a labor transit camp, Terezin later became a powerful propaganda vehicle for the Nazis, who labeled Terezin as a paradise ghetto. In 1944, they forced prisoners to produce and participate in two propaganda projects, a staged International Red Cross Committee visit and a propaganda film the survivors called The Fuhrer Presents the Jews with a City. This drawing was one of a series of stage scenes for Terezin's beautification that included an outdoor concert pavilion for bands like the ghetto swing swingers that you see in this propaganda still, as well as facades of storefronts and a bank. This is a photo of a transport entering Terezin. Prisoners were allowed to carry bundles of up to 50 kilos. And just for a moment, I want you to look in this photograph and try to place yourself in their position. What would you take with you? The things that come to mind, of course, layers of clothing, food, but mind you, it's an uncertain destination. And the other thing that I really think is very important to hold in your mind, you've been under occupation, you've been under Nuremberg racial laws, you've been isolated from the community. So what do you bring besides clothing, food, medications? And what I think is really remarkable is that many amateur and professional musicians chose to smuggle in musical instruments. Now this was perilous as the Nuremberg racial laws forbade the ownership of instruments by Jews. And these are among hundreds of thousands, and I'm gonna say that again, hundreds of thousands of instruments that were confiscated. So I want you to think of the logistics. If you were a prisoner and you had the audacity, the courage, the determination to bring a cello in, how do you smuggle that in? And for those of you who have, um, and you could be an amateur, you, you have a musical instrument, you know you have a bond with your instrument. So imagine cutting up the cello into pieces and putting it into the lining of your clothing to smuggle it into the camp. That is real determination. At first, prisoners secretly held informal concerts. Becoming aware of these activities, the Nazis swung between periods of prohibition and indifference, eventually co-opting them for their propaganda purposes. With the growing number of transports, a remarkable and unparalleled cultural community developed amidst the daily reality of starvation, death, disease, lack of adequate medical care, and overcrowding, a place where over 33,000 prisoners died. So my challenge in writing Our Will to Live was to find a way to bring you, the reader, into this rich world while avoiding the pitfalls of, of a dry, scholarly, academic work. And how could I bring these artists, in a sense, out of the shadows of distant memory? And I believe I found this through the Terezin concert critiques and writings of Victor Ullmann, a composer and prisoner. He would be our guide, much like the poet Virgil was to Dante in his Divine Comedy, taking us into an unimaginable world. Further enriching that experience is artwork created by prisoners documenting the cultural activities. They are part of some 500 works collected by this man, Carl Hermann, who was a member of Terezin's Jewish administrative leadership. So in October of 1944, Hermann and Ullmann received transport notices to Auschwitz. And both men made fateful decisions to leave their most valuable possessions behind. Ullmann entrusted his manuscripts to a friend, while Hermann hid this artwork under the floorboards and in the walls of his barracks. And miraculously, they were recovered after the war. 
So before sampling excerpts from Ullmann's critiques with artwork and music, I'd like to touch on Ullmann and the scope of his critiques. So this is Victor Ullmann, and he's sitting at the 50th birthday celebration of his mentor, Arnold Schoenberg. He was part of Schoenberg's Viennese circle. And I love this photograph because when you look at this person, this is a, a young man who's exuding an air of confidence and great promise. It's a special moment. And, and in the 1920s and 30s, Ullmann carved out a rather distinguished career as a composer, pianist, and conductor. He was deported to Terezin on September 8, 1942, where he soon became a towering cultural figure as a composer. And you'll note in the back, in the bottom of this manuscript, you see the date with Theresienstadt on it. He also produced chamber concerts. This is the studio for new music. <clears throat> What is really attention getting here is when you look at the one, two, three, four, five, the six composers, um, Zemlinsky, Schoenberg, Haba, he studied with them. All right, so here is a person who is connected to the culture and he's sharing it. And then this is one of many surrealistic aspects of terrorizing. There was greater artistic freedom within the camp than in Nazi Germany and occupied lands because these composers, because of their Jewish background, would have been deemed degenerate. And so artists were not allowed, audience members could not attend concerts that would have programs representing their music. His critiques draw us into the performances held within the barracks, and he wrote st about stagings of Tusca and Fledermaus, to name a few. But I want to caution you as you look at this barrack scene. Performances were given basically in the attics and basements of the barracks. And in the winter, especially in Central Europe, winters are very harsh. There's no central heating, summer's going to be very hot. <clears throat> For those lucky enough, they could sit on a bench or on a crate, but a lot of people were standing. Uh, the, the staging is of a Tusca. It was not elaborate costumes and stage sets that you would associate with an opera production. They had to use the materials that were at hand. Ullmann described instrumental and vocal recitals, choral and chamber music programs. His critiques introduce us to inspiring musicians who brought their fellow prisoners hope and a momentary escape from despair. So one of those inspiring artists was the Czech composer Pavel Haas. And you'll see that as we share some of the music, I start out with just their dates to give you a sense of these shortened lives and where they died, where they were murdered. In the 1920s, the newly established Czech the Slovak Republic was home to three towering composers, composers who would be very familiar to you. Smetana, Dvorak, and Janacek. And Haas was considered Janacek's prize pupil and successor. By the mid-1930s, he was a highly regarded composer of classical, film, and theatrical scores. But Haas's professional and personal life suffered a dramatic turn with the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1939. This is a photo with Haas and his wife and daughter and marriages between Jews and non-Jews were forbidden under the Nuremberg racial laws. Haas divorced his non-Jewish wife, Sonia, to shield her and their daughter from persecution and the transports to the East. On December 2nd, 1941, Haas was sent to Terezin. Separation from his family, along with the miserable conditions in Terezin, took a tremendous toll mentally and physically on him. In the critique, titled Concert of the Anschel Orchestra, Ullmann notes a performance of a work by Haas, his study for string orchestra, and he writes, Karl Anschel is a conductor of remarkable stature and abilities. The fact that he has heroically welded together and trained such an ensemble 
is proof of both his qualities and superhuman patience. Anshel is a pioneer of new music, and hence his very beautiful and impressive premiere of Pablo Haas's study for string orchestra. The piece shows the hand of a musician who knows what he wants and is capable of achieving it. So this is a photo where you see Haas taking the bow, Anshel is the conductor, and this is for the propaganda film. Haas was among those artists forced to participate in the performance and production of his study for the Nazi propaganda film. And in this still, we see him taking the bow, and at the same time, the narrator declares, quote, musical performances are happily attended by all. The work of a Jewish composer in Theresienstadt is performed. This is another still from that performance in the propaganda film. And it's eerie looking at the faces of these musicians, and later the camera pans into the audience. And seeing those faces with the knowledge that most of them were sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz just weeks following the critique and the filming. After his liberation, the conductor, Kaur Ancho, went on to a distinguished conducting career. He fled in 1968 the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, and he became the Toronto Symphony Orchestra music director. And I tell you this because <clears throat> There's further Boston connections with this music and especially with this piece because 50 years after the production of this film, I brought the score of the study to Seiji Ozawa, who at that time was the music director of the Boston Symphony. And the moment I mentioned Carl Anschell to him, Seiji started tearing up because Seiji succeeded Anschell in the Toronto Symphony before coming to the Boston Symphony. And he knew of his history, but he didn't know about this piece. And Seiji went on to conduct not only performances in Boston, but we did it in Carnegie Hall and we took it on a US tour. So this is a poster from that Hermann collection in Terezin of a concert that premiered Haas's four songs on Chinese poetry for baritone and piano. I, I think it's his final masterpiece and perhaps his most personal work. And in the critique titled Carl Berman Leader Evening, Ullmann glowingly writes about this piece. He writes the following. The honest, courageous, and very multi-talented artist, singer, composer, and conductor, Carl <coughs> Berman, was an apprentice until this day. And if one has to begin by thanking him for his exemplary, distinguished, and well-chosen program, one's next duty is to joyfully thank Pavel Haas for his beautiful gift, his four songs from Chinese poetry, which premiered this evening. So Haas's songs, he writes, are full of life and relevance. Once heard, one can no longer do without them and wants to live on more intimate terms with them. It is only in this manner that over time, the new art catches on. And this is a bit of the wit of Ullmann. He then inserts, he says, I find this music has become an indispensable friend, just like a good book, just like everything one earns by practicing. It's a beautiful analogy. And, and it also shows the graciousness of, of Ullmann, who is a fellow composer, and he's showing his admiration and support for Haas. So I'd like you to hear a portion of one of the four songs, but first look at the poetry. There's a few things I'm struck by. Here is a Czech composer, and he chooses poem from the Tang Dynasty. So he jumps to yet another culture. And you look at the poem, and it's a poem of, well, the bamboo is swaying in the wind, and there's the moonlight. So you have the imagery of nature, but then I highlight for you, I am thinking when we will meet again. My eyelids are missing the dream because it flew away. And when you hear the opening of this song, which is called A Sleepless Night, I think we can all relate to this. You'll notice, even visually, the piano introduction, it goes back and forth. It's very chromatic, but it tosses and turns. Every one of us has had a sleepless night, right? We're always tossing and turning every which way. And just when you think you've settled in, now you turn the other way, right? Well, the same thing happens in this music.
It never quite settles. It goes one direction, then it goes back to the other. And then when, when the voice comes in, I want to see if you pick up on something that happens in, at the end. You don't have to be musically trained. I think just use your power of observation on this. The song sort of takes on a childlike character, a real childlike simplicity. pick up what was different in the last say 30 seconds of this just in the I'll give you a clue in the vocal writing <clears throat> they were sounds not words right exactly all right but then, and it's it's pure emotion right la 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 right but how does this tie in this is Haas with his daughter he's separated from her this is the last work he's written he pretty well knows his fate. And with that fate, he knows that he will never see his daughter again. How will she get to know him? And with that key line, I am thinking when we will meet again. And then the childlike simplicity, that's like reaching out to him, the character of the music. And then later on, he's singing with like with joy. To me, as, as a parent too, I think about this. You want to soothe your child. You don't want to get them agitated. You want to take them off of that. And here he takes a song where he says, I'm thinking when I'll meet you again. And then he goes to the pure upbeat emotion and it's not from text. And I think the power of these four songs is he's leaving a message. And I can't prove this by documentation, but I go on the basis of, of, of well, life, living life, but also as a musician. All right, and, and poems that he chooses. And I feel like that's the message in the bottle for, that he leaves for his daughter, that she will not grow up to know him. And the only way she can know of him is through the music. And this is the song where he has that ultimate, hopefully that ultimate con connection. So I mentioned to you Carl Broma, the man who sang those songs in Terezine. And that gentleman is in the middle and then uh, of the one photograph, and then here I am talking to him. And in these photographs, <clears throat> we had just performed in Terezin in 1991. It was to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first transport to Terezin. And then I, I got to know him over the course of a few years, and he would share stories with me. And one was when he told me that Anshel, the conductor, told him of the last moments Anshel and Haas were together and they were on the transport and they were now in the selection process in Auschwitz and during the selection process Haas had a horrible coughing fit and he was sent to the gas chambers <clears throat> and Anshel was convinced that's what spared him that he was able to be moved to the other side So I want to switch gears about another part of this book because the book is as much about art as it is in some ways music. It's not only the concert critiques, but there are over 200 works from this collection that are in the book. And the graphics, the design and the imagination, I think are stunning. And to me, it reflects 
a tremendous pool of talent. These are the Terezin artists and they were in the drafting room of what was called the technical um, office. And these artists, they were tasked with drafting construction plans, designing statistical charts, and illustrating official reports for the Nazi command. And many artists created decorative arts and paintings for the Terezin SS and their families. They were ordered to decorate selected sites and design worthless camp currency in preparation for the 1944 Red Cross visit and the propaganda film. And I want you to note, this, this is one of the bills from the currency. You see the stereotypical Moses figure holding up the Ten Commandments, and then there's the Jewish star, and to denote that this was Jewish money. This was the camp money. So I want to share something about the, the consequences that these artists suffered because they were at great risk. And this was a very difficult section for me to write in the book, um, especially involving the following artists you're about to hear. I write, visual artists took tremendous risks to document the harsh realities of Terezin. The most famous example is the dramatic story of Leo Haas, Bedrich Talsig, known as Frita, Otto Ungar and Felix Bloch, whose drawings and paintings powerfully detail grim scenes of starvation, executions, sickness, overcrowding, and other aspects of daily life in the camp. Food and tobacco, among the key commodities for bartering within the camp, were smuggled in by members of the local Czech police. Through this pipeline, the artist managed to sneak works out. Several works found their way to Switzerland encouraging the artists to intensify their efforts. Artists also hid a large portion of the remaining artwork inside the walls and under the floorboards of their barracks. Friends buried some 200 works by Frida, and Leo Haas hid more than 400 works within the walls of the barracks. Following the discovery of the smuggled artwork, and shortly after the Red Cross visit, the four artists were rounded up and sent to the cellar of SS Camp Commandant Karl Rahm's headquarters. Rahm, Adolf Eichmann, and two SS officers began the interrogation of the artists. They sent them to the small fortress with their spouses and children, and included three-year-old Tomasz Talsig, who you see in this drawing, <clears throat> and seven-year-old Susanna Ungarova for further interrogation and torture. There they beat Felix Bloch to death and crushed Ungar's drawing hand. Haas, Frito, and Ungar were sent to Auschwitz. Frito perished there, and Haas was ultimately liberated. He was the sole artist to survive. Haas returned to Terezin after the war and recovered his and Frito's hidden artwork. He and his wife adopted little Tomaszek. So in these critiques, as you would expect, Ullmann focused on classical music, but he did step outside of classical music and covered the German and Czech cabaret productions in Terezin. German shows tended toward the nostalgic, incorporating popular songs of the 1930s. The Czech productions focused more on satirical aspects of life in Terezin. Karl Schwenk was among the most popular of the cabaret artists composing several productions in the camp. The first cabaret performed in Terezin was Schwenk's The Lost Food Card, and it included the hailed Theresienstadt March. It was adopted by the prisoners as the camp anthem, and it declared, everything goes if there is a will. Tomorrow, a new life starts. We'll pack up our bundles and go home and laugh on the ruins of the ghetto. In the critique titled The Schwenk Premier, Ullmann praises him. He writes, Schwenk, he's our Aristophanes of Theresienstadt, and unfortunately only rarely appears, even though he would have enough material, talent, and inventiveness to transform his annual contributions into a monthly review. And here's a bit of his wit now. He puts in quotations, shake well before use. 
He says, that doesn't refer to the medicine this time around, but to the patient. After one and a half hours of laughing and shaking from laughter, it is entirely impossible to raise any critical objections. Schwenk achieves the level of satire and thus true art. So in this photo, there are several stories. I think you recognize one of the people, right? So <clears throat> it's Yo-Yo Ma, and the gentleman at the piano is George Horner, who is a survivor of Terrazin in Auschwitz. And I knew George dating back to the early 1990s, and he, he played accordion and piano in Terrazin. He knew Schwenk very well. He also knew a few other composers. But he wouldn't talk publicly about it, and it took a while for him to start opening up to me, and it really helped my research in many ways. Um, but he wouldn't play the piano. And a few years went by, and he happened to live in a suburb near my parents, and I had finished soloing with an orchestra there, <clears throat> and my parents held a party after the concert, and George was there. And I don't know what really prompted George, maybe having um, a couple of glasses of wine, right? But suddenly he's at the piano and he's playing just popular tunes of the 30s. And this goes on for about 15, 20 minutes. And now I hear pieces that this is new to me. It sounds like Schwenk, it's, it's, it's cabaret in nature. He finishes playing a few of these songs, and I finally I go up to him and I ask, who was that? And he says, that's Schwenk, it's from Terrazin. He says, I have the music. And I'm like really excited because, talk about a lost manuscripts, right? So I said, can I see it? Can I see the, the pages? And he looks at me, smiles, and he says, no, you can't see it, no. I said, why? He says, because it's up here, right? <clears throat> so I finally get him to sit down and notate it. He's still not playing publicly. A couple of years go by, and Yo-Yo, who's been a, a, a good friend for, of mine for over 30 years, he finally agreed to do what we do as an annual concert in, in Symphony Hall for the Terrazine Music Foundation. You were there last, this last October. And... Um, here is Yo Yo's going to play the program, and a lot of times you get the big artists performing, and they'll say, I'll do one or two pieces. I, I don't want to do a whole program. Right. Yo Yo, who's incredibly generous, says, No, we're going to create a program. I want to play from beginning to end. Right. Okay, while this is going on, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, maybe we could get George to play. Right. So I talk to George, and I also tell him, I said, Yo Yo's going to play. And George looks at me and he says, I'll play if Yo-Yo plays with me. All right, this is chutzpah, right? <clears throat> so now I gotta go to Yo-Yo. I said, so I, I know George Horner, he's 90 years old, he played in Terrazine, he'd like to play with you, all right? And his Yo-Yo says, yeah, sure, let's do it, all right? So they get together the afternoon of the, the performance that evening, and they're playing through the pieces. My only worry with George is he's 90 years old, and he hasn't played in public for over like 50 years. And I, I, I said to him on the side, I said, I said George, do you, do you have music notated? Do you need it up there um, you know, on the piano? And do you want me to sit by the piano, just as comfort? He says, no. Nah. He says, you could wake me up at 3 in the morning. I could play this in my sleep. All right, this is not a problem. All right. He goes out and he plays with the yo-yo and we can't get him off the stage. He's having such a good time, all right? So I'm, I'm closing out the program with two excerpts from their performance, all right? And the first one is a lullaby. And I'm gonna ask you to do the same exercise we did earlier, which was looking at a photograph and placing yourself in that moment as if you were in that audience, all right? And you can't quite do that, but how soothing this lullaby would have been for these people to hear.
that spellbinding is that it just touches you, right? So simple, right? And what that must have meant for those people to hear it. So there's one other piece I want to play for you. It's very short. And the history of it, what I'm struck by as Schrank's character. So imagine a man who is in his concentration camp and he decides to write a piece that shows solidarity with another group thousands of miles away. A different group, but they're human beings, all right? And he writes a song, How Come the Black Man Sits in the Back of the Car? It's rather extraordinary. Right? His social consciousness is not confined within the walls of a concentration camp. That's one of the few times where Yo-Yo gets upstaged. I mean, think about it. I mean, that, that was just such a memorable event. So a couple things I want to share just about the book as in, in closing. One of the big challenges, I think, for an author is what's the title? How do you capture the essence of your book? And I take the title from Oman's Terezin essay, Goethe in a Ghetto, and he, there he writes, I would only like to emphasize that my musical work was fostered and not inhibited by Theresienstadt, and that we in no way merely sat around lamenting by the banks of Babylon's rivers, and that our desire for culture was equal to our will to live. And there it is, those last four words, our will to live. Because this was the credo that goes throughout Oman's critiques, through the music of these composers, through the spirit of those artists, their will to live. And we tried to bring them out of the shadows of distant memory to bring you into an extraordinary world. And why do we all want to do that? I think also because like Schwenk asked the question of the plight of somebody else. Does this history and music, does it further rich, enrich our awareness of the world we live in today? We're, we're already in the midst of watching what's going on in Ukraine but we can look at other hotspots as well, or at home, and looking at the disparities of justice. And I'm not trying to preach right now. I'm just saying that what I find is the journey that I've gone through with this music and the artwork, it, it opens my mind further. Look at Haas, a Czech composer, and he reaches back to Chinese poetry. Schwenk thinks about the plight of a black man. <clears throat> Their consciousness knows no boundaries. Their art and music and their voice transcends all these limitations and they ultimately held on to their humanity which the Nazis tried to deprive them of. So that's the major part of this journey. I would also just quickly show you in the book there are 500 footnotes. You don't have to read them all but what I'd like to point out, if you look at the top, at 21 or 22, I made it, it was important for me to put all the transport numbers in. And you wonder maybe why, why this minutia? Well, it's the effect of seeing name after name not being a number, all right? One group, one regime decided they were no longer the name, they were a number. They were a statistic. 
and to go on to try to get, you know, for some of them, what did they do before the war? The few that maybe survived, what did they do afterwards? Or you get a case like Otto Weininger, who I, even though we are on a college campus, how many people really know who Otto Weininger was? Right. <clears throat> then you find out some interesting tidbits about him relating to uh, Ullmann and Schoenberg, but more juicy was how did he commit suicide? He was a bit crazy, all right? But, and so there are certain things that give you background. Another thing in this book, there's a QR code, but there are music tracks, so you can listen to the music as you're reading it or afterwards. You can become further acquainted with the richness and diversity of this music. And the last thing I would point out, this is Edgar Krasa, who survived Terezin and Auschwitz, Susanna Rosichkova as well. Um, in translating Ullmann's German into English, this was a great challenge. How do you retain the flavor of his German? And it was the German from the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so what I did is reached out to a, a group of survivors who that was their native tongue. And they, some of them even knew Ullmann. So the idea was in this translation, could we give, capture the flavor? Could we capture his wit? Could we capture his humanity? And in so doing that, that also was a process where as we went through revision after revision, sometimes it would spark a story. They would have a memory, something they forgot about, which would add to the research. So I thank you for having this opportunity of sharing it. For me, it's always a delight to give to people the opportunity of a new world of music and art. And um, I invite you to explore it further with this book. And if you have any questions, I certainly welcome them. Yes. I was just curious, uh, if he had the music up in his head, was Yo-Yo improvising, or was it written for? No, so, well, this, this, is, um, this is another aspect of uh, Yo's amazing talent. <clears throat> so we're there in this artist's practice room at, in the afternoon, and George would play the piece through maybe one or two times. And Yo-Yo would get it. He would figure out, he would know the harmonic architecture. So then after that, they would just play it maybe two, three, four more times. <clears throat> um, and then Yo-Yo notated a few things. But the funny thing is that then he just, he had it in his mind. So he went out onto the stage and they were ready. They knew there, there were three songs they were gonna do and it was mapped out. And the thing is, is Yo-Yo didn't just go in there and say, okay, I got a half hour, this is it, let's try to do it. We spent the afternoon together. And, and, and I also thought, what a gift for George. I mean, can he, I, I, I would play these mental games with my imagination thinking, I can't imagine if somebody talked to him when he was in Terezin or when his back was broken in Auschwitz that, that somebody would say, you know, 50 years from now, you're going to play in one of the greatest concert halls in the world with one of the greatest cellos in the world, cellos in the world, right? I mean, it, it just, life is so crazy in its twists and turns, right? So to me, that was just such, that day was such a magnificent moment of bringing all the years of, of, of working with this together and then thinking, all of this only counts in terms of what does it generate next? Like if you read the book, or, or if I read it, or whatever I do in writing it, does it do something next where I can interact with somebody else? And, and, and it's gotta be from different cultures. Like I spent time in Sarajevo after the siege, and I found that the, the people there who had survived that siege, they risked their lives to go to rehearsals and concerts under sniper fire. And they were using the same language as Holocaust survivors about what the arts meant to them. So we're all in that same humanity, that same soup, if you will. Yes? So there's a museum at Theresienstadt that includes a lot of things about art and music. Yes. It's almost unimaginable what would have happened if you hadn't written this book because all of that information that you got put together with people who were still alive, like the story you just told, mm. wouldn't have been possible. Could you talk through the wellspring for yourself of 
about what led to your devotion to this topic that allowed this to come well. That first time. trip to that first trip to Prague and Terezin, I was I was yeah, before, before that, that what led um, to the trip. Well, reading um, the, the biography of Leo Beck and hearing that there was music written in a camp, which I could not have imagined. <clears throat> so my curiosity was piqued. But I was fortunate. I grew up in a family with, of artists, but also social consciousness was a very important thing in, in how I was raised. And so that, with, with the arts, they were never separate. They were intertwined. And then coming into contact with these survivors who became life mentors for me in many ways, all right? Um, and the life experiences that I would have through that. Um, I mean, I could have very well just spent my life playing in the Boston Symphony. Wouldn't have been, have been a bad life. <clears throat> but this, I, I, got, I got lucky. And the people that I, like this, this woman, amazing woman, and when I took that photo of her, we used to get to lunch. I, I would go to Prague three to four times a year. And I'd always visit, and we'd have lunch, and we'd go downstairs. And here she was battling for her life with leukemia, but she was damned if she was going to not smoke. All right? And I, in fact, she was in a hospital once, and I said, Susanna, you, you could finally get over this habit. And she says, ugh. She says, it's one of the few pleasures I have left in life. Right. How do you argue with that, right? And she would have a glass of wine and a beer. Right? So, you know, and, and, and her life story was amazing, right? Because she, what she endured after the Nazis, she lived in communist and Soviet Czechoslovakia. And this was a world-renowned artist, and her husband was a famous composer. And each one was held as collateral. collateral. One would be allowed into Switzerland or France, but the other one had to stay in Czechoslovakia. And what she went through, that spirit, it's amazing, you know? And so pe being people like that, um, the music speaks for itself too, but it just, to me, this operated on so many different levels that, um, you know, how could I not go down that path, you know? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Okay. Well, thank you. Good evening. My name is Emily Brown. I coordinate library research and instruction, serve on the advisory board for the Holocaust and Genocide Center, and I would like to sincerely thank you for joining us here at the Bristol Community College Library Learning Commons. Coined by Raphael Lemkin, the term genocide emerged during the Second World War. In an attempt to name the horrors emerging from the extermination camps dotting Eastern Europe, the Holocaust revealed to the world the extent to which a people would go to annihilate another. Scholars searching the annals of history have found incidents after incidents of genocide. We discovered that genocide was not unique to our time, but a crime as old as human society. As genocide is neither ancient nor modern, our presentations or reflections this evening reinforce the importance of genocide education. We must reconcile our own nation's recent past, as well as acknowledge what is happening today in China and Myanmar. This crime can happen anytime and anywhere by any nation of people, unless. We're here today to celebrate the opening of a Holocaust and genocide collection, which will help us to learn and understand the devastation of genocide. I believe education is salvation itself. And through learning, we can seek to prevent atrocities and create an enlightened society that embraces our differences as strength. Now, with a world showing levels of violence we hope relegated to a strange and unfamiliar past, we insist that education needs to be our response. The Library Learning Commons has developed in partnership with Bristol faculty and the Holocaust and Genocide Center the Poisoned Path Project. 
This project is designed to provide digital and physical material geared towards the implementation of genocide education across the curriculum. Genocide as an act seeps into almost all disciplines, from the speeches that fuel its violence to the art and literature and music of the survivors, to the investigators that comb the killing fields for its evidence in its aftermath. We must study genocide so that we understand it and prevent it. In tonight's program, you will find QR codes that link both our collection and the Poison Path project. You can scan them with your phone at any time. Again, I'm so grateful that you all have joined us. I would like to now welcome the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. Laura Douglas. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon. I'm also very proud to welcome you to Bristol Community College's Holocaust and Genocide Library Collection opening. This is a very proud day for our college, one that we have waited for. I'm pleased to be here with our academic and regional leadership to celebrate this milestone collaboration between our college's library learning commons and the Holocaust and Genocide Center. We are grateful for everyone who took the time today to join us, including the chair of our Board of Trustees, Joan Medeiros, <laughs> President Emeritus, John J. Sprega, <laughs> the Consul General of Israel to New England, Ambassador Meron Rubin, and some of our legislators who may be here either in person or in Zoom, Senator Michael Rodericks, Senator Mark Pacheco, Senator Rebecca Rausch, Representative James Hawkins, Representative Stephen Howitt, Representative Paul Schmidt, and Representative Alan Sylvia. The son of a Holocaust survivor and director emeritus of the Supportive Services Program of the University of Minnesota of Duluth, Paul Truer. <laughs> Boston Symphony Orchestra member emeritus and founder of the Terezine Music Foundation, Mark Ludwig. <laughs> Members of our Bristol Community College leadership, faculty, and staff, and also members of the Jewish Federation of New Bedford and Bristol County Savings Bank. As you will learn from our speakers, this unique library resource collection will enhance the work of our Holocaust and Genocide Center to inspire conversation about the Holocaust and other genocides across the academic curriculum at Bristol Community College and beyond. This collaboration is also deeply rooted in Bristol's vision and values to advance a vibrant, diverse community through education that respectfully embraces and affirms individual perspectives and identities. At Bristol, we are committed to diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunity. We strive to remove barriers so that every member of our college community can realize their full potential. Diversity enhances our ability to support student success, to innovate to meet the challenges of the future, develop lasting partnerships in our community, and to achieve excellence. It is essential to our mission. Thank you again for your continued support and for joining us this evening. It is now my pleasure to welcome Consul General of Israel to New England, Ambassador Maron Rubin to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 
wonderful opportunity for me to be here and uh, I really am honored uh, that uh, I was asked to uh, participate and to be with you in uh, the launching of uh, uh, the project. Uh, I really must admit that uh, uh, when looking at uh, Holocaust and Holocaust education, uh, there is nothing more important uh, than, than doing so. Uh, as you know, uh, Massachusetts uh, signed into uh, existence the Holocaust Education uh, Bill, the Genocide Education Bill, I'm sorry, uh, which uh, requests or, or brings into uh, all schools uh, and uh, centers of learning around uh, the state uh, the necessity to learn about uh, genocide. Uh, one uh, would hope that uh, also we will see uh, also the understanding and uh, a little bit more uh, focus on uh, what has been going on, what went on during the Second World War and how uh, the Holocaust came to be about. Uh, but I think that the most important thing as uh, libraries and all collections are uh, is the basis, as was mentioned, of education. Um, I find that some of my most difficult audiences uh, to speak before are those uh, who, uh, uh, for them, uh, a year or two years seems like ancient history. Uh, and when you teach the youth and you try and talk to the youth, uh, the problem is that uh, they don't have the background. Of course, the other difficult audience is those who know so much that it's very difficult to explain to them, uh, and especially those who've got decades of, uh, of understanding. Uh, but going back to the education that needs to be uh, felt and shown and understood, I think is one of the most important uh, cases that we have. The youth of today have an infinite amount of, uh, of uh, uh, information at their fingertips, and it's literally at their fingertips. But to go through that information and to focus in on that information, to get the correct information, and this is one of the main problems of today's society, to get the correct information, uh, and an information that is uh, unfortunately or that isn't filtered is, is something that's very, very difficult. And uh, uh, this is one of the things that the uh, Consulate General uh, of uh, Israel to New England uh, is uh, interested in being involved with, is interested in helping in the outreach programs to the different institutions and to the different schools. Uh, there are a lot of things that are available and we will do our utmost uh, to uh, connect the dots and to help uh, the, uh, the different institutions around this uh, 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 magnificent state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as your, uh, as your uh, governor likes to remind everybody, uh, and make sure that the Holocaust education is understood because when for example uh, Mark uh, mentioned uh, and showed the picture and said picture yourself in the audience it's something that people find and the youth find very very difficult to understand and I'll tell you why it's because those who grow up in the 21st century and those who uh, understand or, or have had a very uh, privileged life find it very, very difficult to see themselves in a different situation. It wasn't just a group of people in an audience listening to music. That music, as was mentioned, saved them, gave them that extra strength for that day to continue uh, to 
live life in, an, in a situation that was incredibly difficult. And this is one of the major problems that we have today is to explain to the youth and to the young people how different it all was. Um, I'm going to be very direct and say that sometimes I hear, uh, especially with the terrible conflict that's going on now between uh, and the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, uh, for some unknown reason, well, no, it's, maybe it's not an unknown reason, people think that if you take away the McDonald's and the Starbucks and the uh, credit cards of the population of Russia, it just might shake them into some kind of understanding that life will be terrible. Uh, it might change their way of thinking, it might change the whole situation, but it doesn't. Because that's not the way people live. It's very difficult. They tr people are trying to project the way they live on the rest of the world. It's exactly the same problem that we have in explaining what Israel is all about to the world. We don't have neighbors like Canada and Mexico. We don't live in the same neighborhood. It's very, very difficult to explain. And once again, explaining about the Holocaust, you have to put yourself into that situation. Walking around Auschwitz some 15 years ago, which was my, the first time I forced, I actually, I think I, had, I forced myself to go. I, I, I thought it was, it, it was so important, and especially getting myself ready to send my uh, grown-up, today my grown-up daughters on the, uh, on the trips to, uh, the, um, to the camps in, in uh, Poland. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you walk around Auschwitz and even though it is chilly, there's grass. The people ate all the blades of grass. There was no grass in Auschwitz. It was all eaten. This was something that was so terrible. You know, you, you, you have to put yourself into a mindset. And this is exactly what centers of learning, uh, like yours in uh, the, in, uh, uh, in uh, this library, are, will have to bring about. And I, I really salute you on the work that you are doing, because it's not an easy one. And uh, it has to go on and on, and it never stops. And I think that that is one of the major, major things. Uh, once again, uh, I'd like to thank you for the honor of having been here. And uh, I will make sure that uh, uh, we do our utmost to connect the center here in Bristol College with other uh, centers both in Israel uh, and uh, in other countries so that we would be able to uh, enhance the learning experience of uh, the children and uh, the importance uh, of this collection and the library. And once again, thank you very much uh, for the honor and I look forward to meeting you after this, uh, uh, this event. Thank you. very much ambassador Rubin it is my honor to introduce the behavior or the Dean of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education Dr. Kathleen Pearl so I, I uh, was a student of, of German history and today I was brought back to uh, some memories that I hadn't really brought up in a long time. One of them was that I was an archivist at the Leo Beck Institute in New York City. So I got to meet people who came in to donate. I got to meet survivors. And I got to work on a project of interviewing uh, people who had come to this country as refugees. Among them, Albert Einstein's cousin, her name was 
Perta Natov, and she was a medical doctor in Berlin uh, before the 30th of January, 1933, and then she went to work one day and couldn't get into her office, and her, um, her sign was off the door and people weren't talking to her. And she eventually escaped and came to New York City where she worked as a house cleaner, a maid, and earned enough money to put her, um, her son and her husband, who had also been a doctor, through medical school. So I would visit her every Thursday for quite a while. And when she would talk about her life, which was a fairly privileged life in Berlin before the, th the 30th of January, 1933, her whole countenance would change and her whole sense of herself would change. She went back to a happier place. And I can't say that we're living in New York and even doing all that hard work was unhappy. She had accomplished something. And she, to me, I thought about her tonight because of these themes of uh, survival and resilience. And that doesn't always mean you come out completely happy and you come out to be a doctor, but you have a spirit. So I would like to also talk about when I first came here seven years ago. And uh, I came from a community college in New Jersey that had a very large and active uh, Holocaust and genocide center and a, and a community. And I came here and we had the potential for the same thing. These, I don't know if all of these books lived in Ron's office in boxes, but <laughs> It was kind of hard to walk around there. And I see this whole project of, put, of having a collection, a Holocaust and genocide collection, as a kind of act of, of survival and resilience in and of itself, so that the, the memory of what happened, the knowledge of what happened, doesn't go away, doesn't disappear. So, I, and I'm very, very happy to see the work here uh, institutionalized in the library where we can track use of the books. Um, LeBron doesn't have to be his own librarian. Uh, our students have better access, certainly, to learning, and we can really educate in a way that we couldn't seven years ago. There were wonderful things that happened seven years ago, including all of the public meetings that Ron and the advisory board and Emily and, and some of my colleagues sitting here tonight worked on so that we did have events, educational events from the time I, before I got here and from that time. So I'm very proud to be here and very um, grateful. And I'm gonna create a little bit of more work for Emily. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I'm going to donate a book to the library. And the title of the book is The Last Kings of Shanghai. And it has to do with two families, two very large families, Jewish families, that lived in Shanghai in the, into the 19th century and into the 20, 20th century. And that, those were the Sassoon family and the Kadori family. And I didn't know this until I took a group of students. And again, in another life, I took a group of students to Shanghai. And I discovered that there had been a vibrant Jewish community there. And there were actually two synagogues in Shanghai and, met, and others in other cities that I went, we took the students to. So this book is called The Last Kings of Shanghai. And it's about the, um, the rescue of 18,000 refugees from Nazi Germany to China. So here you go. Get to work. <laughs> so I'm, I want to thank you, and I'm, I'm very happy to see so many people here participating and actively participating. So thank you very much. Wow. I'm very actually appreciative to have more work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Pearl. Um, I am exceedingly proud to introduce you to the director of the Holocaust and Genocide Center, Dr. Ron Weisberger. <laughs> the 
were told to take off my mask, so that's a good idea. Oops. Take off my hearing aid, too, now. I just got hearing aids, so I'm trying to get used to that. Uh, um, anyway, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Dean Pearl. Get these things around my ears? Okay. Um, President Douglas, President Emeritus Spraga, um, Ambassador Rubin, Mark, thank you, and all of you for attending this uh, event. Um, we certainly appreciate the support of the administration and the staff for, as this has developed. If you uh, will indulge me, I want to thank a number of people, as I usually do, because there's so many people involved in uh, an enterprise like this. Um, we have a um, we have an advisory center, and a number of our faculty and staff are on that, including uh, who are here: Robin Worthington, Rebecca Sumfeld. Beckett's at Beckett's, <laughs> some fell. Um, Carl Sameda, who's actually doing another, you know, excuse me, back, back up for your name. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Sameda, Kathleen Hancock, uh, Colleen Avidikian, back there, um, and Emily Brown, of course, and Howard Timberg, uh, who he and I have been colleagues teaching a course on the Holocaust for the last 19 years, if you can believe it. Uh, and actually one of the things that, from which this center emerged. Uh, <clears throat> we've been collecting books from the inception of this center. And as a matter of fact, we started this uh, when Ellen Hall, I don't know if Ellen Hall's here, um, who was the former president of the New Bedford Jewish Federation, donated the initial books um, to, actually to me, uh, and that was a real motivation and incentive to start a center. Um, so it's been very important, and the Jewish Federation of New Bedford, uh, we're very indebted to them because they've, um, not only did they give us these initial books, which has grown into this wonderful uh, collection, but they've uh, funded us in part since its inception. Um, Mir Cohen is the executive director, I don't know if he's here, and Manya Bark, who is here I know, is the current president of the Federation. So uh, that's a very important um, institution in this region, and obviously they support Holocaust education. Um, one of the things is, that comes out of this Federation, there's a Holocaust education committee, which I've been on for a number of years, and Cindy Yoakum, who's here, is the uh, director of that, uh, and they were very instrumental in the development of our center, and still, still, still are to work together. Um, we also uh, other members of that um, of the federation, uh, Holocaust education, include uh, Marsha Anafrock, who would be here, but uh, she's on Zoom, and. Um, she, along with Gary Brown, who is here, there he is over here, former, um, he's a former uh, superintendent of Old Colony Vocational High School. The, but the three of us have been planning a, a summer institute this summer because one of the big in, uh, initiatives and very important is to work to reach out to uh, the regional teachers, uh, both parochial and public schools in our area. And uh, we're going to do a summer institute for the teachers. Um, and uh, I think that we've been going into schools and speaking to teachers, uh, our students and teachers, uh, but Durfee High School, for example, and others. Uh, but we, the summer institute will be very important. We'll be able to bring in people from the US Holocaust Museum and other places to work with our current teachers. So um, I, I think as some people have pointed out, the misinformation that is out there, sadly, needs to be countered by real education. And that's what we're trying to do. It's currently what Mark has been trying to do. Um, and it's crucial, especially at a time like this when things are happening in our country as well as the world. So we're happy to be a part of that. 
Um, and uh, <clears throat> as I think uh, the ambassador mentioned, uh, the state of Massachusetts finally passed a, a, a bill which incentivizes the teaching of Holocaust and genocide. So we're certainly part of that. And we know Senator Michael Rodericks was very much involved in, in shepherding that through. So I really appreciate his help. I think he's on Zoom and his aide, one of his aides is here now today. So um, it's very important that our, you know, our legislators uh, get behind this and they, and they have. Um, regarding this, um, this amazing collection, um, we are indebted to the work of Emily Brown and the staff of the uh, library here. I, I suggested, as I think Emily mentioned this, <laughs> we had a smaller collection in my office and I suggested that we should expand into the library. Emily was incredible energy and, and the others worked for the last two years to expand this collection. And frankly, we, this is the largest collection in this whole region. Uh, nothing against you, Matt Startmouth, but we have a much bigger collection <laughs> than, than they do. Um, and maybe next to the Providence Holocaust Center. Uh, but, so this is going to be an amazing resource, not only for our faculty, our staff, our students, but also for the community. And I'm really indebted to, to uh, Emily and, and her staff for the work that they've done uh, in putting this together. Um, also, we appreciate the support of Laurel Whistler, who's the Dean of the uh, Library and Learning Commons, and she's been behind us for the, from the inception. So again, we have the support of the administration. For sure. um, finally, just uh, a word about one of the things we've been doing uh, is collecting 1.5 million buttons which represents the amount of children, Jewish children, that were murdered during the Holocaust. And uh, <clears throat> it was suggested to me a couple years ago, I had buttons, where do you get buttons? We are on the verge of reaching our goal. We will reach our goal by the end of the semester. We will have collected 1.5 million buttons. Uh, and, and, and that is thanks to so many of our students, and only here at Durfee High School, who have contributed buttons and have counted buttons. You can imagine counting, <laughs> but they, they've, they've done it. Our honor students and others have done that. And we're gonna plan on a, we'll be working with the administration and others to plan a, uh, a monument using these buttons and also art projects. Those of you who have been in the Jackson Art Center already, our art department put together two portraits, Anne Frank and Stephen Ross. So these buttons are just concrete examples each button being a child. So we're, we're very pleased. I want to thank Corrine LePage, I don't know if she's here. She's an honor student who has helped coordinate our, up there, who helped coordinate our, um, it was re, uh, a former, for Linnell Dean suggested it, a couple of someone else has done it, and Corrine has taken over last year and has done a fabulous job. Uh, so, Finally, I want to thank uh, Emily Brown, Sarah Pike, my assistant Kate Rose for putting this whole event together. There's been many hours, as you might expect, to try to do this and uh, it's turned out to be very successful both uh, online I hope, and in person. So thank you very much and I hope people will, of course, make use of this incredible collection as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Associate Dean of Library Learning Commons, Laurel Whistler, who will speak about the values of this collection. Distinguished guests, friends of the Holocaust and Genocide Center, and Bristol community members, let me add my words of welcome for the celebration of the opening of the Holocaust and Genocide Center in the Eileen T. Farley Learning Resources Center at Bristol Community College. 
Cultivating this collection and using it as the basis for education arises from the moral imperative to build a better world. This world we choose to cultivate would be free of the impulses that lead to treating people as the other and would strive to uphold their humanity. In this spirit, our thoughts tonight are especially with the people of Ukraine. I'd like to tell you the story of a family with whom I'm acquainted. This family's experience and accomplishments illustrate why we are here. In 1938, shortly after the Nazi Anschluss of Austria, a 12-year-old boy named Robert Troyer boarded a train in Vienna with Mia, his mother. They were headed to London, where Mia found a job in the countryside as a domestic laborer. His father, Fritz, was a member of the underground and knew he had little time to relocate his Jewish family to safety. Along the way, their train was stopped and boarded. All of the Jewish passengers were made to disembark. Mia clutched one of Robert's hands in hers as they grasped the handles of their suitcases with their other hands. They were in the center of a tight cluster of people and were surrounded by guards who were organizing the group. Mia insisted, come and don't look around, as she led him with determination out of the group and into the safety of a nearby restaurant. The two remained there for hours. The next train for their destination arrived, but Mia waited. She watched to be sure it was safe. Mia urged, come, and they made it safely with their suitcases onto the new train as it was moving away. The pair eventually reached London safely. Robert stayed in boarding schools until his father, Fritz, was able to join them and arrange for passage to New York. Robert's cousin, Erika Schulhoff Rybeck, had a similar story. Having ridden a kinder transport, train out of Austria on her way to a Catholic school in Scotland. Erica's parents, who were Mia's sister and her husband, chose to protect Erica from worry and did not tell her about the war. Only a handful of the family survived. Fritz, Mia, cousin Erica, and a few additional cousins. In the United States, Robert eventually married, had three sons, and commenced to make his communities better places. After an honorable discharge from the Army as a World War II translator in the Philippines, he became a labor organizer in Milwaukee, then moved to Bemidji, Minnesota, where he taught English in a Native American community. He and his family began turning a forfeited, unproductive farm into a beautiful forest as a tree farm. Robert became a community organizer for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and worked to improve the community of the Ojibwe Indians of the Leech Lake and other reservations. Divorce and remarriage to a tribal judge who was the first female Indian attorney in Minnesota produced four additional children. Robert and his family moved to Washington, D.C. for continued work in human services in government agencies. Publishing a book about his tree farm led to other newspaper articles and books that celebrate nature and offer lessons about the importance of caring for the environment. Robert died in 2016, just short of his 90th birthday, and he left a legacy for the people of Minnesota. Robert's seven children, likewise, have made significant contributions that shaped local health, jurisprudence, and wellness, as well as having national impact on learning, language, and recasting indigenous experience in Americans' understanding. Smith and Derrick worked in the hospitality and restaurant industry in Arkansas and North Carolina, serving healthy and delicious food for others' nourishment and enjoyment. 
Paul, who is here tonight with members of his family, developed a nationally recognized peer tutoring program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and was also a pioneer in developing ePortfolio, used nationally by half of college students today. He currently is involved in high water and erosion activism in Duluth and is an author of two books on environmental awareness. Anton and David are professors and authors who work to revitalize the Ojibwe language and cultural practices and uncover indigenous American experience. Megan follows her mother's footsteps in tribal justice, serving as associate judge in the Fond du Lac Tribal Court in Minnesota. Micah is an emergency medical physician practicing in Bemidji. Robert's seven children have multiple master's degrees and doctorates, two Guggenheim fellowships, numerous awards for their writing, and recognition from national and international audiences for their work with language, culture, and learning. His 26 grandchildren and numerous great-grandchildren, loving parents, children, uncles, and aunts, include musicians, dancers, artists, pharmaceutical representatives, water quality specialists, aspiring attorneys and historical researchers, educators, human resource developers, athletes, and engaged community members. It is a remarkable and prodigious family who are alive today, having an impact for good because the 12-year-old boy and his parents were able to narrowly escape the Jewish Holocaust with only their suitcases. This collection we're celebrating today is a repository of books and interactive teaching materials, such as the Trunks for Tolerance and Poisoned Path Project, which share the experience of people like Robert Troyer and Erica Rybeck. Remembering the Jewish Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, the violence against the Uyghurs, Ukrainian genocides, past and present, and other examples matter because through studying the horrors of the past and present, we can learn to recognize and attempt to halt future violence against groups identified as other. And situated here on the historical Native American Poconocut lands of Southern New England, this collection at Bristol reminds us that we are not isolated from economic gain that can arise from mistreating groups of people. Dehumanizing others and extinguishing their souls deprives the world of people who could have contributed so much to humanity as Robert Troyer's family so richly illustrates. As we explore the resources that are assembled in this collection, let us remember the richness inherent in our communities as we celebrate diverse identities, experiences, perspectives, and cultures. Let us engage our communities in work that brings people together for greater understanding of our shared humanity, such as through telling stories and celebrating cultures. Let us do what we can to celebrate our Ukrainian friends. And let us commit to holding our political and governmental leaders accountable to upholding virtues that serve the best interests for everyone in our communities and globally. We are privileged to have Paul Troyer with us this evening to share some remarks about the meaning of this collection to the families of survivors. Thank you, Laurel, for your thoughtful comments. The Rybeck and Troyer families, at your invitation, have no donated books from their family libraries to the Holocaust and Genocide Collection. Mem members of our families are here today to celebrate the opening of this important collection in a significant place. The Learning Commons. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I've been asked to share a few remarks about the meaning of the Holocaust and genocide collection to our family. The best way to do so in a short amount of time is through story. From my earliest memories, we had a large bookshelf in our living room. The bookshelf was well organized, curated, cleaned often. My mother was a librarian. It was constantly growing with the addition of books, some of which were written by family members. The bookshelf provided me with a sense of warmth and security. Reading, study, and writing feel like basic human drives necessary for survival. What I remember most are the lively readings, conversations, discussions, and even debates taking place within re easy reach of our bookshelf. I can imagine my grandfather, Fritz, and my grandmother, Mia, in the shadows of their bookshelf in Vienna. The year was 1938. The Nazis had invaded Czechoslovakia. The family discussion must have been very difficult. I suspect the wisdom held in their readings and discussions guided them to decide to immediately leave their home taking their 12-year-old son, my father, and a few cherished belongings on a journey which led to their new home, eventually, in America. Seventy years later, in 2009, our son, Galen, wrote and co-directed a play, My Father's Bookshelf, performed at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The topic of this comedic tragedy was the loss of family history resulting from Alzheimer's. Many of our family members, including my father, attended opening night. That performance was highly emotional. We remained, as did most of the audience, after the showing to participate in a discussion of the central idea. What happens to important knowledge when it is erased from the memory of family elders? Four years later, after that performance, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. <clears throat> Not long after that diagnosis, I received a call to hear him sobbing uncontrollably. This, this is just like, just like, you know, like Galen, Galen, his voice trilled off. You mean my father's bookshelf, I asked? Yes, yes normally articulate and a lover of words and word play, he could not find words to describe his nightmare. Nonetheless, that same year, my father volunteered his annual, to give his annual talk on the Holocaust to students enrolled in the local Ojibwe school. He couldn't drive himself to the event because of cognitive decline, but once there, he spoke for hours with students many of whom carried family histories of genocide against indigenous people. My father passed away January 8th, 2016, three weeks shy of his 90th birthday. Seven months ago, I visited my father's first cousin, Erica Rybeck, who at the time was grieving the death of her beloved husband, Walt. Like my father, she too was suffering from short-term memory loss. While visiting, she held my hand, and with the other place over her heart, she said, please, please tell our story. Paul, please tell our story. Her life journey, including traveling in 1939 on the Kinder Transport Train from Vienna to Scotland, is well documented in her memoir, On My Own, Decoding the Conspiracy of Silence. What does she mean, please tell our story? It had already been written well. Erica Schulhoff Rybeck died at the age of 92 on November 19th, 2021. I can only conjecture answers to these difficult questions about memory loss and history, but I know without a question of doubt that memories of genocide are seared into the minds of first generation survivors they are often the last memories to go. I also know that the impact of genocide is carried through subsequent generations. I carry it in my blood memory. 
but I struggle to understand the impact the Holocaust has had on me. I suspect my daughter and grand granddaughter who are here today would say the same. This leads me to Erica's comment. The Erica, Erica's question I puzzled over for a long time. The answer is beginning to show itself. Her story is well written, but to be understood, it needs to be read with guidance, empathy, and discussion with others. To be understood and, and remembered, it must be made both personal and it must also be made social. This is precisely what the Holocaust and Genocide Collection and the Learning Commons offers. Difficult topics like genocide require collective efforts of writers and artists coupled with the support of librarians, teachers, and readers who have friends with whom they can discuss its meaning. This collection, located in physical and virtual spaces for reading, studying, and discussing genocide, provides a means for developing this type of deep social learning. It is a place where we can pull our chairs close together and listen carefully to important stories. It is a place where each of us when we choose, can share our thoughts, feelings, and ideas. It is a place where decisive and responsible actions can be discussed and taken when necessary. The Learning Commons is my father's bookshelf. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Tro Tro Troyer, I apologize. <laughs> it has been an honor to receive such a distinguished group of guests and speakers this evening. Mr. Ludwig, author of Our Will to Live, will now be signing books, um, which are available to purchase for cash or check at that table in the back. You can't leave without signing our copy, though. All proceeds of the sales of this book will go to the Tourism Music Foundation and, the Hol and Holocaust and Genocide Education. If you would like to donate to our work in the Bristol Community College Holocaust and Genocide Center, please see our representatives at the donation table back here to the right. I must thank Dr. Ron Weisberger for approaching the Library Learning Commons about building this collection in 2018. Thank you, Ron, for your vision and dedicated service to education. I would like to thank my colleagues, Sarah Pike and James Eamon. Without their efforts, we would not be here tonight. And a thank you to Laurel Whistler, who gave us the approval, the final approval and support for making this a reality. And a special thanks to Ambassador Rubin, President Douglas, <laughs> President Spraga, um, Paul Troyer, Mark Ludwig, and all of our guests here this evening. That concludes our event tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great evening.